bow down in worship today. Come to bow down in worship today. We lower our hearts before you, Almighty God, Almighty God, yeah. Father, we have come.
King Jesus. Let your name be magnified in this place. Be lifted high. Oh, be lifted high. We lift up the name of Jesus. We lift up the name.
How many of you are here this morning? Okay. A couple of you anyway. Well, it's good to be back. And uh, it was hard enough to get here. But stuff is going on. And uh, I'm, I'm going to try to download quite a bit on you, but I'm not going to have too much time to dig deep. I know how this works. You've got to beat those Baptists to the rest restaurants. And uh, so I won't delay you too long, but uh, it is good to be back here. This was a church that actually I started and is one of my home churches, so uh, I'm not a visitor. But I wanted to mention a few things. Uh, I try to always address some things I get a lot of questions about, so... Uh, a lot of people were asking me, are the Panthers going to win the Super Bowl? <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I think so. But uh, if they do, it will be a fulfillment to a prophecy that Bob Jones gave us. And if it happens this year, we know they will at some point. But when they do, it will be a marker for us of something really breaking out. But Bob actually told me about the coming of that team to Charlotte years before we had any idea they were even trying to get a team. We didn't know what, Bob didn't even know what he was talking about. But he, uh, 
Now, Bob's laying right over here, so, I, you know, uh, anyway, he's one of those great cloud of witnesses, and I, so I, I try to be as accurate and careful, but I think it was 1988 when he called me and said, Black Panthers are coming to Charlotte, and they're coming to the lumber yard. I said, what does that mean? He said, I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> And uh, I said, well, it sounds like some kind of attack. <laughs> and he said, well, it may be, but they're coming to the lumber yard. So we spiritualized it, lumber yard, building materials. There's an attack coming on the building, you know, and all this stuff. And then uh, several years later, we hear that they're getting an NFL team. We still didn't tie it together. But then when they named them the Panthers, and they're symbol is a black panther i said oh you know this this could be what bob was talking about and then when they said they were going to build the stadium on the old lumber yard <laughs> i said okay and uh bob had already gotten some more stuff on it and uh about how it would be a reflection of some things we were just going to learn a whole lot from that team and we have over the years in many ways but uh, one of the other things, you know, Bob used to get a lot on sports teams, get a lot of prophetic revelation. He, uh, in 1985, he said the Kansas City Royals were going to win the World Series when, I mean, nobody gave them a chance. I mean, it was like they, and they came out of nowhere and they won it that year. Now, Bob would normally say these things like in spring training or early in the year. Later, he accurately predicted the same thing for the Atlanta Braves, and there was tremendous revelation in that. Some of the meaning of the names of the players and things like that, and what unfolded in a couple of those games. We even got the score before the games happened. And uh, we told some people, but, uh, but we didn't tell those who we thought would run to, to Vegas with the information. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, but we also, you know, last year, early in the season, I only told a few people this for the same reason. Some things you just don't broadcast. But the uh, Lord showed me early in the season that the Patriots were going to win last year. I didn't want to hear that. <laughs> and uh, he, the Lord said, no, they're going to win. And he said, why? He said, it's going to be a message that patriotism is going to win. And uh, that there's going to be a return to patriotism in this country. It's going to help turn the country back to him. Just some things were going to happen there. I still say, well, Lord, I got the message now. Can we have somebody else win? We don't like those patriots. <laughs> you know, but uh, no, he, uh, he did share. But occasionally he does speak through the things that have our attention. But if the Panthers win, it means it's pretty much all hands on deck. Really, I'm looking for revivals to start breaking out and another great awakening. And to me, it's just kind of symbolic that it could be the 50th Super Bowl when it happens, that is year of Jubilee. When you, you know, it's not just debts forgiven, but it's restoration of inheritances. And... Uh, so this could be the time, but uh, we'll see soon enough. But, uh, you know, there is a lot going on. I think we're already seeing some signs of a, another great awakening. Uh, there is an awakening going on. And it's showing up in all kinds of places. Uh, but there's a difference between revivals and awakenings. You know, uh, revivals... They, you know, revival means to revive, which pretty much, I think that's a good uh, word for what is needed now, a reviving of the church, a reviving of, you know, people to their destinies and purposes. Uh, uh, but, you know, in studying church movements over the years, uh, you know, revivals tend to be really spectacular, but really short-lived. 
If one of them lasts over a year, it's like a granddaddy of revivals. Most revivals are good to last a month, two months, even some of the most spectacular. A few have lasted more than two years, but it's really rare. Uh, Vance Havner, one of the great revivalists, once said that he, he considered revivals to only be a tiny fraction of the purpose and move of God. We tend to revolve around, we like them because they're so spectacular, but uh, he said, you know, they're kind of like the, the big sale down at the department store. It gets all the press, gets all the attention, everybody runs out because the giant sale. He said, but that's not the normal business for that department store. It's the day-by-day -day normal merchandising that is their real core business. And their success is dependent on that more than the sale. And I think it's true in the church. I would say revivals are at best, and very best as a stretch, 2% of the work of God. You know, it's the day-by-day -day maturing in the Lord, day-by-day -day witnessing. You know, we've done the study all over, and at least 95% of all Christians did not come to the Lord through a revival, did not come to the Lord through a crusade, did not come through a Christian television or anything else. Over 95% of all Christians, and we've studied this every way we can, came to the Lord through the witness of a friend or relative. How many of you came to the Lord through the witness of a friend or, or relative? You know, now, I thank God for that other 5% or 2% or whatever, uh, but that's not the normal business. There's no more powerful evangelistic force in the world than an encouraged church. They, where we're day by day sharing our faith, living our faith, we're growing, maturing, living with vision and purpose. And, uh, and I believe we're going to see this become even more effective as the times get darker and the times get more confusing. Anyone who knows where they're going, who's living with purpose, is going to stand out more and more. And... Uh, but I think we're about to start experiencing some revivals. Okay, one is coming to Charlotte that I'm sure of. I think it's going to be big. I think it's going to be huge. Uh, Mary Lance, who used, was one of the great intercessors in Charlotte, uh, I used to meet with her, she and her husband, Bob, occasionally, and, and uh, they owned the Lance Snack Food Company, but she, they both passed away now, Bob and Mary. But uh, she was one of the great and long-term intercessors for Charlotte. But one time she told me this story about how the, she grew up next door to the Graham family. And she and Billy Graham were the same age. And um, they grew up next door. And one, one time both of their families decided that uh, they were going to fast and pray for two things, get together, both families, and fast and pray all day for two things, for revival in Charlotte and for the Lord to raise up a ministry there that would touch the ends of the earth. Now, Billy was 15 years old, and he thought they were wasting their time, wouldn't even go to it. <laughs> and... Uh, it was, I think, the, that year, later in that year, when he met the Lord and things changed for him. But uh, Mary said he wouldn't even go to the meeting. He wouldn't even get together with him. Said, you're wasting your time. And uh, anyway, I said, well, you know, Charlotte still hasn't had a, an authentic, what I would consider revival since then. Uh, she said, oh, it will. I said, well, do you consider Billy Graham to be the ministry raised up that would touch the nation? She said, absolutely not. He was a token of what God's going to do, just a seed. And she said, the revival's coming, and it's going to touch the whole earth. Okay? 
But uh, there are many other things like that, and we know, and we've known for years, a lot of the aspects and, and things, but it could be about to unfold. Now, <clears throat> you know, we always say that Charlotte is where we meet with the people, Moravian Falls is where we meet with God, <laughs> you know. And uh, so we love to get away, you know, and revivals are hard. People don't realize how hard they are and how rarely does any church that hosts a revival survive it. That is rare in history. I'm not saying it's supposed to be that way, but that's a historic fact. They can absolutely wear out a church. That's a good way to go. But I don't think that needs to happen. I think if we had a right foundation, that it wouldn't have to do that. And there have been a couple now. But, you know, I go down to Pensacola every summer. And, you know, that Brownsville revival down there was spectacular. One of the few that actually lasted more than two years. But the church is just a shell of what it used to be. I mean, for a while, I think it was touch and go whether it would even survive. It's starting to do better. Now, <clears throat> there are things like that, but a lot of that has to do with the burden of revival falling on just a few people and the saints having not been equipped to do the work of the ministry. I think if we don't have the Ephesians 4 thing really happening where there's true equipping going on, moves of God are you know, he's going to do his work. He's going to touch multitudes of people and gather them in. But those who aren't prepared for him are going to get washed away by him. It's like a big wave coming when your house isn't built on solid ground. <coughs> so at the same time, you know, we've, we've had little touches. We had that breakout that happened in Charlotte. And, uh, you know, that was... Uh, Began in our high, one of our high school classes. I remember sitting in my office and all of a sudden hearing noise. Just kept getting louder and louder. And all the parents who were coming to pick up their kids that afternoon, they were staying. They didn't pick them up. They didn't go anywhere. And pretty soon it was a large crowd gathering. Just got bigger and bigger. And it just went on and on. Went on for months actually. We met night, nightly, and uh, it was intense, but it started with, you know, we had a girl in, high, in our high school, CSEL, you know, her legs were bowed in so much her knees were almost pointed at each other, and she could barely walk, you know, had to kind of shuffle, and, and uh, was going to have to have this major surgery done, and she was going to be in traction for or cast for about six months, and all this stuff, and the kids just said, no way, we're praying for you. They laid hands on her, and they watched her legs straighten out, her hips, everything else. And, I mean, they were perfect. <clears throat> and an undeniable miracle to everybody. And that's what, it, all of a sudden, that's all the noise I started hearing. And then other things. You know, we had some of the most incredible miracles happen during that time. And that was really great, but it almost wore us out. And, uh, but I think we learned a lot from it. We learned a lot. We got one thing we've got to learn is pace yourself. I mean, so many great things were happening. You didn't want to miss a single meeting. You were afraid to go, but you were afraid not to. And uh, and when revival is happening, all you want to do is meet. When it's not happening, I appreciate those who keep meeting out of duty and everything else. They just want to be touched or seek the Lord, but sometimes it is hard. Well, in revival, it's totally not that way. I mean, all you want to do, you can't wait to get off work and get back to the meetings. It's like that every night, but you just, there is a way that we've also got to use wisdom and pace ourselves. And, and uh, but this is, I think, coming upon us. Now, revivals tend to last short periods of time. The great awakenings that have come to this country have lasted decades they may not have been quite as outwardly spectacular, but the work was done, a much deeper work was done. And some, I think a case could be made for the first great awakening, could have lasted 50 years, 
five decades where it will still do, have an impact. Second Great Awakening is probably 30 years. I was just in the little church, Pole Green Church, a couple of weeks ago. It's about as big as one section here. I mean, it's a tiny little thing. And I wish I had the hookup. I would show you pictures, but uh, it is the smallest thing. Patrick Henry was in that church when Whitfield came through preaching, George Whitfield. And uh, it so ignited that little community, which is only about 300 yards from my sister's house up outside of Richmond. I mean, you can walk to this place easily from there. But they have built a tremendous monument there. You could, it has a history of Christianity from Christ on. And the great moves of God are all listed, written out in the stones. You, you do this walkway thing. But that's the, the church, they said the Revolutionary War was born out of that church. And we became a nation. They said this was the seed. This is where it happened. And uh, it wasn't just Patrick Henry, but it was others. But he lived a few hundred yards on the other side of my sister's house. And, uh, but a nation was born when a revivalist came through preaching. Of course, Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards, John Wesley, and all these had a real part in the first great awakening. You guys know all this, right? Okay, good. So I'm moving right along. Okay. Uh, we do have to get ready, though. And uh, one of the things that we're looking to do here is be the real central communication center for our missions. That was originally what this place was designed for, to be a meeting here and downstairs to be, you know, <clears throat> basically a communication center that also could duplicate, be used for both purposes. But uh, <clears throat> I think we're, we're in a position to hopefully be able to go forward with some of our other missions that are up in this area that we feel we need to focus on, youth camps and and things like that, but uh, there's a lot going on that <clears throat> if you, uh, how many of you are on our Facebook pages, sir? Okay, well, that's a good number. Well, we, we're gonna have a lot of information coming out there, also on our websites and everything, and hopefully there's gonna be a lot more that you're gonna see things starting pretty soon, okay? Uh, they have to do with you know, our place is a ministry up here. This is what we really consider the head and the bodies down there. Because Jesus is the head and this is where we come get our stuff from him most of the time. This is where we meet with God and I think it's also going to be a real headquarters place in a lot of ways. But, uh, you know, it says we can't know the day or the hour of the Lord's return. But, uh, you know, it also says, 1 Thessalonians 5, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Then he says, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you like a thief. We should not be surprised by any of these things. We can't know the day or the hour of the Lord's return, but we should know the period. Things are happening. We are really getting ready for the change of an age. I think many right here are going to see that transformation. He says, for you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness so then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. And, uh, you know, it goes on to talk about how, you know, God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. But we also know almost many of the things the Lord spoke of about the end of the age, it's going to be intense. But we have a foundation that can't be shaken. So when we hear about things in the world shaking, shouldn't bother us. 
if it really bothers us and we get fearful, some areas we built our life on are more on this world than on the kingdom. And we should use that as a challenge. Okay, I should be there. You know, I started warning last year about another major downturn in the world economy. It, started, it happened like uh, New Year's Day it began. I really thought, I, and I'd been saying it would be the first quarter of this year, I really wasn't expecting it to happen on the first day of the year. But there's some things I know in the natural, and some things I felt like the Lord had shown me. The whole world is, it's, well, it's just going to get more and more intense. At the same time, we have the Daniel 2 scenario where while the statue that represented all of man's kingdoms is collapsing, the Lord's kingdom is growing. That little rock grows into a mountain and it keeps on growing until it fills the whole earth. So where are we going to invest? <clears throat> Wouldn't you love to be able to invest in a stock that it was impossible for it to go down? And that it was impossible for it not to increase. Doesn't it say that about the kingdom? There will be no end to the increase of his kingdom. So where should we be investing? Now, I'm not just talking about money there. How about our time, our attention, our study, our preparation? Everything else, our money too. Because where your treasure is, there will your heart be. That's why the mark of the beast, when the ultimate test at the end is about whether we can buy, sell, or trade, it's an economic mark because it's going to reveal where people's hearts are. And one of the ultimate idols of the human heart is money. And an idol isn't just something you love, it's what you put your trust in in place of God. And sometimes we put a lot more trust in our stuff than we do him. And these times are going to reveal that. That's why I think, <clears throat> how many of you get uh, the word for the week that I do? Just lets me know how many of you are real Christians. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> but uh, we're doing a study on the book of Revelation there. And do you know the book of Revelation is easy to understand? And you know, it's the only book in the Bible. You get a blessing just for reading it. Tells you, you're, you're blessed just for reading this thing. But you know, it's a revelation, not a mystery. It's not hidden. And uh, you can, it's really easy to understand. There are two keys given right in the first sentence. You get those two keys down, you can understand that book. But if you don't have those, it's impossible. You can't make any sense out of it. Maybe a little bit, but not much. Those two keys are the first one, the most important one, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. And when your focus starts becoming the Antichrist, you're going to miss the whole point of a lot of this. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay? So there is stuff in there about the Antichrist, the man of sin, the mystery Babylon, the great harlot, and all this is in there, but that's not the main th point. But why is it that one study had over 90% of the books written on the book of Revelation were about the Antichrist? I, we missed the point there. I told you about an experience I had up here on the mountain. Well, I was, I was sitting, in, I was actually laying in my easy chair. I was ready to take a nap. It's like all of a sudden I was in the radar room of a warship. And having been the Navy, I recognized where I was. And in some of these experiences, you, I mean, you just do stuff, you know what to do. And I'm standing in front of this big radar screen on, that was on a table kind of similar to this. I'm standing there looking at this big radar screen, and the Lord himself was standing right next to me. And there's a little blip coming on the radar, coming right at it. I knew what that meant, so I said, turn the ship 90 degrees this way, then 
turn it back this way. Any way we turned, the blip just kept coming, didn't move. So I braced myself for the impact. And I'm like this, and all of a sudden the blip goes away. And I said, Lord, what was that? He said, that was the great tribulation. He said, it's inescapable. But if you stand next to me, you're not even going to feel it. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> and this thing that we focus so much attention on, it's a tiny little blip. It's coming. Don't worry about that. Seek the king. Get a, have a revelation of Jesus Christ who's seated on, seated on a throne above all rule and authority and power and dominion. I don't care what happens in the world, and a lot of really bad stuff is going to happen in the world. You know what God's people are going to be happy? Getting happier and happier? It's not going to be being happy at other people going through troubles. We're going to have the joy of the Lord that is our strength growing and increasing in us. The, the Lord told me we were going to be so happy that the whole world was going to think we're retarded. Sorry, if you're too worried about what the world thinks, you're going to have troubles anyway. It's going to get weird, okay? But we're going to be not only joyful during this, we're going to have the peace of God that can't be shaken, where the world's falling apart and we're just not even moved by it. Because the worst thing that can happen is we die. Guess what? The mortality rate hovers right around 100% anyway. You're going to die. I hate to deliver this news to you, but you're all, you know, got mortal problems. And it's going to happen. It's appointed for everyone to die once. That just happens. There are worse ways to go. And I think one of the greatest sources of our peace and our joy is no fear of death, but a happy expectation. I get to graduate. I get to go be with the Lord. <clears throat> Christians should die better. But stuff is happening, okay? And it's going to increase. But a couple of things that I think are going to happen, especially for the church, there are two major things that the Lord gave us as a ministry years ago. <clears throat> that we were to focus on, and I think they're just now really starting to take some serious definition. <clears throat> but his church is called to be many things. You know, a field, a building, a priesthood, a bride, all these things, a temple, <clears throat> all these things in scripture. But there are two aspects of what his church is called to be, which I think you, I don't, I've been all over. I've been around the world many times. I've been around the body of Christ, and I still haven't seen these two. Like I believe they have to manifest. One of them is that we become the army we're called to be. We're called to be a military force, but not in human military terms. Weapons of our warfare are not carnal, much more powerful, but there, there are military disciplines, military there's a military mentality that I think is going to come upon the church. We start thinking more strategically. We start knowing how to plan <clears throat> in ways that we can not only take the ground, we know how to hold it once we've taken it. And uh, there's a lot of aspects to that, but the Lord uses his title, Lord of Hosts or Lord of Armies, 10 times more than all of his other titles combined. He is a martial leader. Oh, thank you. I've got one right here, but thank you. <clears throat> I've had this all my life. I'm going to get healed one day. Okay. But I don't even think about it, <clears throat> but I do have that. But uh, we're going to understand his martial characteristics and I think it's going to help us tremendously to move towards what we're called to be. 
and uh, also to, to fulfill in the Ephesians 4 mandate to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, where I don't see it being done anywhere. I see little bits of it being done in a few places. I mean really little bits. But according to that, <clears throat> it's got to be the proper functioning of every individual part. And how can there be a proper functioning if, if people don't even know what they're called to? In the body of Christ today, I believe less, far less than 5% even know what their calling or purpose in the Lord is. Even less are doing it. How well would you be doing if only 5% of your body was working? The upside is, look how awesome the impact of the body of Christ has been with only a tiny percentage of the body work. What's going to happen when the whole thing's working? It's going to be incredible. So we, we have a big upside. But I know when I went in the military, one of the things that we need to learn from the military, I think in the body of Christ, as soon as you go in, you're immediately given a battery of tests, know what your you know, abilities are or potential abilities, and you're put on a track to do that as your job. And right after boot camp, where you, a whole lot of boot camp is about learning one of the most important things that I think, again, a tiny fraction of the body of Christ really gets right now. It's about hearing. It's about listening. And this, this, this is a shockingly desperate need we're going to become shockingly more desperate for the times to come. That's what marching is all about. I remember being so mad. I went in the Navy, and here I am marching most of the day, you know, in boot camp. I'm not going to march around that ship. Why am I wasting all this time learning how to march? I was, you know, moved going into aviation, so I know I'm not going to march around the airplane, But it wasn't about that. It's about listening. Hearing those instructions and learn to obey right away. If you didn't, you look like an idiot really quick. Everybody's going this way, you're going that way, and you look stupid. And in the beginning, that's all it was. <clears throat> Everybody laughed at you, you look stupid. But there were increasing penalties as we matured in boot camp. And pretty soon... Okay, everybody, the whole company, down push-ups. And then run laps. And then, because one guy messed up. Why? Because they were teaching you, one guy can cost you the whole ship. One person not doing their job, not listening to instructions, and not doing it right could cost all of you your lives. And it, it taught everyone who wasn't prone to be listening, who was prone to daydreaming or whatever else, I better put listening on my top priority. I remember after a while, we had what were called blanket parties. I know they don't allow that now, but we would throw a blanket over somebody in the middle of the night and just beat the, you know what, out of them. Because they, they, made, they made life really rough for us because they weren't listening. But we were also thinking about this person. Better that they have a beating now than they die later. And take a lot of others with them. Because sometimes when you don't hear the right turn, you take, make 20 people fall down. And if you sleep on your watch or you're not paying attention on your watch, everybody can be lost. So, <clears throat> but two exceptions. With the exception of those who have been through military training are those who have been in high-level professional sports or at least high-level sports, team sports, it's hard to find people that really know how to listen and hear instructions. I'm just saying, which by the way, in the South, you say that after saying something that offends everybody and it's okay. All you have to do is end with, I'm just saying, <laughs> and you're good. And if you want to speak evil of somebody, 
All you have to do is say, but bless their heart. <laughs> and it's good, all right? <clears throat> Not really. <laughs> Hear me. Don't do that. But uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm, what I am saying is in the future, it's going to be life or death that we heard the word Lord when he said, don't go down that road or turn here and, turn, turn and, and can follow his instructions. And it says in Psalm 32, seek the Lord in a time when he may be found for surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. Don't wait until the flood comes to know his voice. Now, I know a lot of you are committed to that and are in teams now, but I, I tell you, we've got to go way beyond where we are right now, all of us, for the days to come and hearing for ourselves. I mean, it's helpful for, to be in these prophetic teams and everything else. This is helpful, starts waking up, but trust me, we've got to go to a whole new level in hearing him. I know when I got in aviation, when I started flying airplanes, all of a sudden, if you don't hear the right heading, the right altitude, the right speed, you could end up in the same place at the same time as another airplane. Or you could end up, which happened to me once, I got over a target area where, they were, where there was artillery shells flying around. So we've got to learn to hear. Are we attuned to him? What would happen if all of our vain imaginations were turned into intercession? We need a vision of taking every thought captive where we will not waste our time and our minds with vain imaginations and daydreaming and stuff like that. We are going to be disciplined and we're going to be sensitive to the Lord when he speaks. I know, listen, we uh, were at a lunch with uh, Coach Joe Gibbs, I think it was year before last, but year or so ago. He was telling us how hard it was for him to convey the, the plays to the team on the field and how often players would get them mixed up. And how difficult this was to get his players, even on the professional level, to really be focused. And then as soon as they see the play, they engage in their mind, this is my part, what I've got to do during this play. And he said, almost everyone, someone's doing something wrong. How much more successful could the whole team be? If we start listening, I'm, I'm just saying, and bless your hearts. <laughs> okay. We got to be the army. I remember when I, went, I had to go through Marine Corps infantry training. How many Marines do we have here? A couple? Okay, Good. And uh, normally I have Navy guys sit next to the Marines so that when I use big words, they can explain them to you. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I'm just saying, bless your heart. <laughs> it's really the other way around. <clears throat> now, I've got so many Marine Corps jokes from hanging around with Jerry Boykin. He's got an endless supply of ammunition but always turn them on him when we're in a place. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> I had to go through infantry, ITR. Okay, well, I had to go through that training. They didn't do very good with us, but they tried, bless our hearts. <laughs> but uh, I remember them telling us when we were learning to set up fire teams, say, if we tell you to go here and you get over there and find out there's another place that's e even better position, and you move to that, he sa they said, if the enemy doesn't kill you, we will. Because if fire starts coming out of a place where we didn't send anybody, we're going to think you're the enemy. You've got to hear. You've got to follow instructions. And I know in, you know, war zones, you know, any time in the Navy, you got caught sleeping on watch, and the penalty was incredible. But if it happened in a war zone, it was execution. They could kill, they could execute you for, because you're jeopardizing so many people. Where's the watchman ministry of the body of Christ today? Our people should, shouldn't keep getting ambushed. Churches shouldn't keep getting ambushed. 
our communities and things. Now, there are some. We've, we've had some spectacular examples of God getting warnings through to people. Even terrorist things stopped. Terrorist attacks stopped. But uh, I think we've got to go to a new level. But this is all a part of that military demeanor that I think we've got to to have in the seriousness where it's not just people getting wounded and killed now, but we're talking about eternal souls. You know, it's far more important than just the natural. Now, the other aspect of what we're going in, and we're, we've got to see come forth in the body of Christ, is we're called to be a city, a community of communities. And I know I've discussed this some before, but, you know, the church is built on koinonia. If there are any Greeks here, I know it's kinonia, but in the south it's koinonia. Koinonia, not ecclesia. Do you understand that? You know what ecclesia is? These are the two words used in the New Testament for church. And ecclesia speaks of the structure, the government, the framework, and I think that's what most churches are built on. But in the New Testament, they were built on koinonia, on fellowship. On, and this is not just something where you pat each other on the back once a week and has your family and has a job and all that. This is being bonded together to the degree you can't separate the parts without them dying. That's biblical koinonia. That's, that's why the only place in the New Testament where it addresses why Christians are weak or sick or die prematurely, 1 Corinthians 11, is because they didn't have koinonia. And you can have plenty of ecclesia. You can have the right government and all the, every, the structure and the meetings done right and everything else, but if you don't have koinonia, it's not going to work. You got a form of godliness. But where God is, there's koinonia. I believe you can have koinonia without very good ecclesia, but it's not true the other way around. Because the only place where it says, if we dwell in the light as he himself is in the light, we have koinonia. That's the same word. It's translated communion, fellowship. But it is a deep, look it up in the Greek, it's a deep bonding together so we become one. We can't be separated. It'd be like tearing a member off or arm off or something for someone to be lost. That's coming. Before the end, the, the body of Christ is going to become what it's called to be. So I think there's a whole lot that we need to do to facilitate koinonia. A whole lot more. And uh, of course, don't have time to talk about, but both of these things. And I know some of the, the koinonia happens because of the battles you go through. It's like David and his mighty men. If you experience combat, you know, there's some things you go through that you just can't, I mean, you're just bonded forever. There's something even better than that, though. I remember a meeting I was in when I was a very young Christian when the visible glory of the Lord appeared in the meeting. And we were all sitting like you were and instantly everybody's on their face. Nobody's, one little lady stood up and said, it's God and everybody hit the decks. And we stayed there for hours. And I couldn't tell if it had been hours or minutes. It was just so intense. And, but after that, I remember everybody who was in that meeting, who I still know, some have gone on to be with the Lord now. And some, anytime I just think of them, there's this warm thing. We experience the glory together. We experience the Lord. That to me is the greatest bonding influence you can have is to experience the glory. Have these encounters with the Lord. We need those. We need them so real, so continuous that it is normal church life. The people that come through the doors outside, their knees start shaking. Now we've had tastes of that before. We had some visitations 
I remember at Presley Road when we had our meetings there in Charlotte where it got so intense and ne- you know, the next week FedEx delivery guys would come into the building and stop and go, what is that I feel? You could tell the fear of the Lord come on. We had that outbreak in Charlotte. That happened all the time where delivery people were just stunned by what they felt just coming into the building. I think that's normal church life, but then we're the church. I mean, his presence can saturate physical places like that, which, but we should be able to go into the office and everybody's just, what is that I feel? I think we're going to start seeing that. That's the Isaiah 60, when darkness covering the earth and deep darkness the people, his glory will rise upon you and his glory will appear upon you. Remember in 2 Corinthians 3 had talked about Moses experiencing the glory, had to put a veil over his face. He was scaring the people so bad. Now it says we have a better covenant. We should be able to do that. We should be able to do that. And it goes on to say right there in 2 Corinthians 3 that the glory that Moses experienced, we're supposed to be experiencing a greater glory. Read that. That's normal Christianity. Are we going to be settlers and just settle? Are we going to go for it? Are we going to go for it? What do we have better to do? What do we have better to do? And why not us? Somebody's going to walk in this. Now, I think we need to see the city of God It's what compelled Abraham to become the sojourner. He had a vision. He saw the city of God. He had a vision of it. And it would cause him to leave everything behind. Do we have that vision? I believe every sojourner, every true sojourner has that same vision. They see what we're supposed to come. And they'll leave everything in order to be a part of what God is building, not just men. And that's what we want. I think there's a lot we can do and we're called to do, but we want to get to the place where you can't blame this on anything we did. Only God could have done this. And where that's the normal state of what we're walking in. This is way beyond us. So we want to lay a foundation. We want to strengthen the foundations. Want to be something that God can build upon. But I think more and more we're going to see this not just happening. We're going to see it necessary. We're either going to be growing in him and growing and walking in these things more and more or we're going to be backsliding. What was the other main thing that was required to understand the revelation. It says it right in the first sentence of the book of Revelation. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ, but who did he give it to? Gave it to John. Who was John to give it to? Nope. His bondservants. And very few Christians are bondservants according to the biblical definition of what that means. I think I talked last time I was here about the five levels of relationship and, you know, believer, which is great. You're in, you got eternal life. But then the next level of relationship to the Lord is disciple. And I think if we would read Jesus' definition of what his disciples are, we would think very few people that we know would really qualify to be a disciple. Some, we've got a I tell you, we've got to do this. We've got to become disciples. The Great Commission is to make disciples, not just converts. I believe watering that down and making all the emphasis on making converts instead of disciples is one of the reasons for a lot of the great weakness that we have today. We've got to be disciples. I tell you, a disciple wakes up every single day with one main thought on his mind. I've got to learn more about my master today And I've got to become more like my master today. It's the driving force of their life. 
And that is required as a foundation for the next level, which is a bond servant. Which a bond servant, they don't live for themselves. Bond servant doesn't wake up, oh, wonderful day, wonder what I should do today. Bond servant wakes up, thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day, but master, what would you have me to do? Bond servant doesn't have anything of his own. You know, bond servant doesn't have any possessions. It actually says a disciple doesn't of their own. They get a big check in the mail. It's master. What do you want me to do with your money that you gave me? It's a whole different lifestyle. That is going to be required not to take the mark of the beast. Which I think we see in Revelation 7. Where the, but the bond servants, you know, whose responsibility is it to take care of the slaves? To provide for the bond servants? The master. And you know, you'll never be more free than being Christ's slave. You'll never be more free. You'll never have a better master. He can run your life far better than we could ever do. But we got to live these things. It's not doctrines. It doesn't mean anything if it's just a doctrine. If we know these things and don't do them, we're not building our house on the rock. Building our house on the rock is hearing his words, and that's first. Next is doing this. We don't just hear it. We do this. Then I think after the foundation of where we really have this nature of a bondservant, we do all things for the sake of his gospel. We were bought with a price. We are not our own. It's a reality in our life where there's a point where he, we can graduate to be a friend. And then there's going on to become a son and daughter. And everybody has the opportunity. It says given the power to become sons of God. We're born again. You're given the power. But how many don't even become disciples? A lot of us, we made the end result the beginning. Where you get born again, you're in, that's good. You got fire insurance now and you're good. No, that, when a baby's born, they just start their life. And it's the same in Christianity. And if we're not growing with that zeal and that focus and that devotion, maturing in him, we're not going forward, we're going backwards. And you can grow in knowledge, in deep knowledge, and not be growing in the Lord. But if you want to understand the book of Revelation, those two things are required. First, really get it, look for Jesus. This is about Jesus. This is a revelation of him. You'll find a revelation of him even in the things that are about the Antichrist. The next thing, you've got to be a bondservant to get this. You've got to have that mentality to understand what this means. So I want to leave you with that. Now, if we've wasted 30, 40 years, the Lord, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day. He can make it up in one day. Now, he usually won't. He'll take two or three days, but no, I'm serious. We don't know how much time, but we've got to set our hearts now, you know what you think? Well, I was never taught that about being a disciple. But the true disciples didn't need it to come from the pulpit. They searched the scriptures. They said, what does it mean for me to be this and to serve him? They found out these things about being a bondservant. Whether they heard it taught from the pulpit or not, they had a heart after God where they would find these things. They would see them. There is no excuse all of us have Bibles. Everybody wants to be an overcomer. Everybody wants to be, but not many want to enough to do it. I think that's got to change now, though. And you know what? He's going to help us. Just as those events happened in Egypt to set God's people free, you see a parallel of those same events in the book of Revelation and they're for the same purpose, to set God's people free. Of all of the entanglements in everything that is holding us back. But it's time to get going. Don't waste another day. Don't waste another week. 
resolve. I mean, there's a lot of stuff we could all cut up. Foolish television. I mean, some of it's good. There's a place for entertainment. I'll be watching the Super Bowl. I may get to be there. But uh, I, I, there's a place for recreation. It means recreation. But I think also there's foolish entertainment. You know, the word entertainment came from the merging of the words to detain from entering. I think that's what a lot of it does to us. We get just caught up in, in, in wasting our time and our energy, our minds. What would happen if a lot of that was spent in prayer or study? or Where would we be today? Well, let's don't waste any more time. And Lord, I pray for all these hungry people here that would come out for something like this. And maybe even stay so long that the Baptists are going to beat them to the restaurant. But Lord, we have food from above. Lord, I ask you for that manna for every one of these. Fresh manna every day. Lord, I ask you for a fresh revelation of your word. And Lord, I ask you for that, uh, that taste for your word so we would be so addicted to it if we didn't get some of that fresh manna every day. We would get the shakes we couldn't stand it. And Lord, as you said, you gave us manna from, you gave the children of Israel manna from heaven to see if they would keep your ways or not. This one determining thing, determine if they would walk in your ways, would they get up first thing every day to seek bread from above? Lord, I ask you for that heart where the, we would be the first thing that we wanted to do because we're so addicted to you and your word, where we just couldn't wait to get up and get with you and get that fresh bread from you. Lord, I ask you for an addiction to the manna from heaven for every one of these. In Jesus' name, thank you so much for your attention this morning.